Hickok 45, quiz time, what are you looking at? Some of you know quite well, some of you might not. That is an AR-15 bolt or M16. This is an old bolt. It's an AR-15 bolt from my old A2, my historical rifle. See, AR-15 A2 was Sporter 2 and uh, bought it in 84. You've seen it. We've not done a chapter two on the main range. We did a uh, kind of a chapter two, we called it at that time, range two video over in range two, but we've not done one here. So it's another opportunity, as I've discussed, to bring out a fine rifle and shoot it again right here, especially one you've not seen for a while. And uh, nice rifle, it's all clean. I have, uh, when I shoot this one, I clean all my firearms after I shoot them. This one I clean especially well. Another little tip I won't charge you for, but because I know I may not shoot it for literally, you know, three, four years, five, 10, because I, <laughs> I, I don't shoot it that often. And so I really want it especially clean. Whereas a lot of my firearms, if I get out a Mauser, you know, or an Op 3 Springfield, you know, I'm gonna clean it pretty well, but I'll probably have it out, odds are, within a month or two or three and be shooting it again and all that kind of thing. It's all oiled up, so no problem. But uh, not, not this one, because I have other ARs, you know, more modern ones that I shoot uh, mostly. This thing has become kind of a classic. Uh, bought it in 1984. I would have sworn it was 83, but I guess it was maybe, I don't know, January, early 84, I guess. It's, it didn't have an exact date on my purchase like I have on most of my firearms. Uh, but I know where I was living, and it had to be no later than 84, and it, had to be, and it was early 84, I think. But uh, just wanted to show you what was clean. And uh, the old bolt is in you know, really clean shape. Might not even have enough lube. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> I come think of it. I've got some out here if we have any trouble. But uh, yeah, just just a neat old gun. And you can tell from the bolt, I've not really shot it extensively. The gun probably has four to five thousand rounds through it since '84. And I bought it new in '84. And we've had it out before, and, and some people, you know, thought, ah, it's not an A2, you got, you got some A1 parts on it, all that. Yeah, you're right. This was, as I understand, a, a brown label firearm, I believe it is, called kind of a transitional uh, AR, because it was just early on the A2s. And so you notice it still looks like an A1 in a lot of ways. Look at that, uh, that mag, isn't that weird? You know, no uh, uh, fence around that, mag release button, and uh, it's just... Uh, you know, the uh, handle is really hard to get off unless you got some serious cutting tools, you know, so it's not as detachable. Uh, you know, it's just an old one. It's a Sporter too. so just a little history, you know, on the uh, AR-15. You didn't know I was a, uh, what was I, uh, tactical wannabe, even back in 84, right? Did the, you know, to tell you the truth, this sort of did make me a tactical wannabe in some people's eyes in 1984 when many of you were not even alive maybe to actually buy one of these evil looking rifles because I didn't have any friends that had them you know why I didn't have any friends <laughs> sorry uh, no I had a few friends but I, I, none of them had them uh, I just thought they looked like fun to shoot so I bought one actually I traded a couple of firearms for it uh, I'll start out with a 20 round mag how's that all right let's just shoot a couple of rounds with this baby oh man takes me back why don't we just start on that whatever's in that water <laughs> oh it has a different feel to it kind of interesting Woo! there's a coffee can full of water let's go on over there and uh try the red uh, square plate I told John, I'm not sure I remember where to hold. I haven't shot it in, uh, oh, I don't know, probably the last video, whatever that was, might have been a couple years ago or something. Try the middle red plate. I didn't remember where to hold, but I thought, yeah, I know it was on, so we'll figure it out. We'll try the smallest red plate. Yep, sights are on. Let's try that orange two liter over there. I'm going to move up so I don't hit the pigs behind it. There we go. Little cinder on the barrel over there. A 
neat old gun. It has a different feel, different feel and recoil, no doubt about it. And I don't know about you all. I've said, I've mentioned this before. I know the firearm's empty now, but I didn't look at the, you know, not from sight at all, but just from feel. It just occurred to me when I had that, that familiar feeling. After you've been shooting a while, you will be able to fire just about any firearm, a rifle, a semi-automatic handgun of any kind. And when it's empty, you'll know there's a difference in the recoil of the bolt staying back instead of taking another round and you know going back into the chamber. It's just very obvious to someone who shoots a lot. Uh, so I don't know, it's just a little tidbit there. So I know it was empty. Oh yeah, and we're shooting federal ammo, mostly 223. And uh, I have some mags loaded. We don't have to load mags and bore you. Because, you know, when I have to load a lot of mags, I start talking about, oh my gosh, vacations 40 years ago or just whatever. You never know what's going to come up as a topic of conversation about some trees I planted back in the 1950s. <laughs> and uh, I've got some firearms on the table. We'll, uh, you'll see the old uh, <laughs> the BFR revolver later. But I brought out the Colt, uh, uh, what is that thing called, 1911 and one of my Smith & Wesson 44 mags. Just again, to, as a reminder that back in 84, the early 80s, uh, the firearms, when I was buying this in that same shop, and it was in Columbia, Tennessee, it was Bear Creek mm, Supply or something like that. It was right on Highway 99, not too far off I-65. Some of you would be familiar with it. And uh, they have a walk-in safe as part of the shop. And it's still there. It's called something else. And I think someone, it's a new ownership and all that, but it was there. And... Uh, uh, I think I was looking for an AR and you couldn't find them just anywhere in 84. There were not black rifles everywhere. Uh, we were talking about that before the video. The magazines, you had to kind of look for the magazine somewhere and find them. You know, no internet, you know. Uh, and so it was, it was a, a new thing, kind of, as far as the commercial market. And I mean, people had them, but not a lot. Um, and, but anyway, it was, uh, it was in that shop. I uh, traded a couple of guns for it. And yeah, back to my topic there. I got off track almost. The guns that were in that shop, the handguns, uh, and in any gun shop, uh, for some reason there were no Glocks in 84, early 84. I don't believe there were any. There might have been some somewhere. I don't know. That was getting starting to when they would start creeping in. But uh, people, I was still, my two firearms I was telling John that I had for kind of self-defense, couldn't carry at that time, legally, were... I had, I know I had a Charter Bulldog revolver, 44 Special, that I did keep in my glove box sometimes. And, but for around the place, I was on, living on five acres at that time in Williamson County in a little log house. I had, uh, I had uh, a Browning High Power. And I know, and I would take it with me traveling a lot. I recall that gun being, when I bought this during that same year or two, that was a constant companion and my series 70 uh, 1911 uh, those were really really common and uh, that I kept for defense and then I had you know several revolvers Smith and Wessons you know primarily I think I still had a Python at that time and uh, so so anyways just a different world a different uh, time so I'll take you back a little bit and we're clear so of course the most important thing about this the firearm is it'll take a bayonet this is the early M7. I think it came about in the early 60s, you know, for the AR or the you know, M16. So that's the early bayonet. And that's one of the beauties of having this rifle because, you know, really a rifle is pretty useless if you don't have a bayonet for it. Uh, it's a thing I have a problem with, like with my, uh, well, the Model 70 bolt guns, and you just don't have a bayonet for them. You know, it's, they're, they're virtually useless uh, other than a little hunting maybe, you know. So anyway, that's the bayonet that was used for, for years, all right? So I don't think that, that one doesn't have a brand name on it. I guess it's just kind of a, I don't know who made it. I bought that long time ago when I bought the rifle, I guess, right about that time. I had to have a bayonet for it. And then this is the M9 bayonet that uh, came out in the 90s, and it fits as well, in case you didn't know it. So it's on the same lug. You know, it's a more serious knife. And of course, that's the transition in bayonets. You know, we went to, and of course, it fires fine with the bayonet on there. That's when, uh, you know, gradually, I guess with that one, uh, is when uh, we, we got smarter 
and uh, develop a bayonet that would actually double as a, a knife rather than a toad sticker like the others. Uh, so it was a very useful tool to have on your side, it was a really good knife, like a K-bar or something, good heavy knife, but still work as a bayonet, okay? And those were not used for, they, I guess they might've been used for a bayonet charge somewhere, but mainly for uh, corralling prisoners and that kind of thing. So you wouldn't have to shoot them, but you know, they're still, you know, if you got four or five soldiers with bayonets, with that poking at you, you know, it's gonna kind of keep you in line. You're not gonna have to be shot, right? I know we had some intruders from Kentucky a while back and uh, got across the border somehow here in Tennessee. And I put one of those on here and I, I helped out in that regard. Just just corralling prisoners uh, that you've captured, getting them back where they belong, came in handy. All right, let's put a, look what I've got. I've got an actual Colt magazine. Yeah, Colt. It's probably made by the same people that make that one, right? For Colt, I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's a Colt magazine. So that seems appropriate. All right. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is, uh, you re do you do realize when I bought this in 1984, uh, because that was just before I bought my Uzi, and I had it converted to full auto, and I had it for 10 years. Not most, many of you know that. I've told that story a few times, but I had one for 10 years. I converted it legally, of course. That's before the Hughes Act. And I paid, I had $1,200 in that Uzi total conversion everything even the little barrel short barrel i bought for it everything so it make you sick uh and john was reminding me when i bought this i could have done the same thing could have just taken it and had it converted probably been just a few hundred bucks three four hundred i don't know less uh had it converted to full auto and it could have been a full auto m16 right here today and perfectly legal you know because i would have had it converted legally just like i could still own that uzi if i hadn't sold it and it'd be worth, uh, if it was still in good shape, uh, you know, between twenty and thirty thousand dollars, you know. Whew. And and that doesn't appeal to me actually. I just assume they weren't worth twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That's the only reason they're. I mean, the fact they're illegal or they're so hard to to come by because they were not outlawed totally. But you know the story. How difficult it was to to get one. So, uh, but this would have been one of those, and I could have I could have bought four of them, really, and I could have had them converted. Why didn't I do that? Well, as brilliant as I am, I, I really can't look into the future. Let's put a round in there. All right. I, I won't say let's put one of those big torpedoes in there like I do sometimes. <laughs> They're not exactly torpedoes, are they? Let's put one on this paper target here or two. Oh, wow. I just pulled down load. Look at that miss. That was horrible. Uh, this doesn't have a wonderful trigger, okay? I've never, let's see, have I? No. I haven't really replaced it. Like like on most of my ARs, I have a nice trigger, uh, either a CMC or a Geisley or something, to where it's just very, very sweet. But I just didn't want to change anything on this rifle. This shoots just fine. Yeah. Let's hit this pin. Oh, we haven't smoked any pot yet. <laughs> Have to hold up a little bit because of the sight, you know, the bore axis. Which, uh, you know, if I've got some 12 ounces there below the plates and a pot, uh, that's a good example of where, wherever I put the sight, it's going to hit probably at that distance, you know, maybe that much lower. So something you have to take into consideration, use a little Kentucky windage, which they don't like me using because I make fun of them. That's not, I didn't have to hold up as much as I thought uh, at that distance. So look at it smoking out, boy. Too much ballastol in there, <laughs> eating up the barrel. Oh boy. There's a sweet old rifle. Look at the condition. Somebody's really taking good care of that. Whoever owned this uh, must be pretty smart, right? <laughs> Let's go back over there. Over the middle way. Now I can tell it's empty again. You get a different recoil with these old guns. If you've ever shot one, it's more of a, a twang. You can feel the spring in the stock. You know, it's a, 
And I can imagine those very first ones when they ended up in Vietnam, and when those soldiers went from firing, say, a, an M14 to that thing and picked it up, because it wasn't as heavy as this. Uh, it was even lighter and felt cheaper and everything. I can just about imagine the feeling some of them had, like, bang, where, where'd we get this? At Walmart? I guess there was no Walmart then, but, you know, that's what, well, Walmart sells guns, of course, but I mean, uh, the toy department at Walmart. So, yeah, oh, man, yeah. What other lies can I tell you about? This is a, just kind of a chapter two, bringing it out and enjoying it again. And uh, just sharing with you. What's funny too about this one is uh, think about all the ARs and all the ones I have owned and still have. And, uh, whoops. I, uh, you know, it's so simple to take the upper off, you know. Uh, and forget that a lot of these didn't even have the quick release, you know, <laughs> on the front there. And so you have to get a couple of screwdrivers out and uh, take that apart in order to get that uh, upper off of there. Yeah, not many of you have had to do that, right? Uh, that's just a thing of the past. And again, I haven't changed that. I could change out the pin, but I was going to keep it the way it was, okay, when I bought it. And uh, I'm not going to shoot it a million times. I'm just going to keep it in good shape. And because uh, it is, it's in very good condition. Uh, and it, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Derek, John's buddy, uh, our buddy, you know, that appears on John's uh, podcast with him uh, quite often, you know, was uh, telling us you know, how they call these things muskets, you know, when he was in the military and because of the length, you know, uh, in today's world, that's a big old long rifle, isn't it? For an AR, uh, you just don't see many with that kind of length in, in that configuration. And of course, you have no rails, you know. Uh, some people back in the 80s would put uh, a scope right here, uh, some kind of scope maybe. I think we had maybe some early red dot kinds of things, but a four-power scope or something would mount right there. And that was that was kind of popular, but you know, no way it was sticking rails and things on them. So you think I should do that maybe? Change out all that? You can't change it out too much. So this one will stay like it is. I'm not going to change out the flash hider you know, really or anything. And of course, in the uh, the A2s, early on, they started putting the forward assist back on the civilian models. And this one's got the teardrop, you know, button on it and all that. And some of you who are extremely knowledgeable about this and the history, you, you, you know, you, you know the parts maybe that are A1 and, and A2 and all that through the transition. And that's the way it is with most firearms. You can look at 1911s or Colt single actions. I've got a Colt single action. Army 1902, I guess it is, and uh, I, I think even in 1907, I have you haven't seen much uh, or at all. I think it might have a black powder barrel too. You know, they changed the rifling when they got away from black powder with those, but then again, they make a bunch of barrel, they make frames, they make all that, and maybe they have more barrels and they use up the barrels, and so you may get a firearm that. Uh, has a barrel that was made a year ago or two years ago and you know it takes a while all those parts they're not going to just throw those parts away they work just fine just like with this you know so so there's usually a transition between uh, the old version of something and the new one the a2 the a3 the a1 a2 whatever they're called all right so that's no big surprise just the way gun companies work and it's not a problem so in a way it's just kind of a unique a more unique rifle with that transitional period well the only thing i did do to it is i put a thicker uh butt on it i forgot about that but that, that's the only thing i've done to it really uh, took the original butt plate off and put a you know as you can see i get about an inch there with this firearm recoil is not exactly a problem so i just need the length and it fits me like a glove and it's fun to shoot let's shoot just a little bit more okay here happens to be some ammo Normally I shoot a bunch in a chapter two, but I don't want to wear this baby out. I don't want to get it tired. I want to keep it in pretty good shape. We'll shoot a couple more though. Again, we're firing an AR, you know, a high speed round, so I'm not just going to shoot any old thing. Uh, there's a little bit of cinder left over there. Let's see, if I can knock some more of that off. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, slow down. So as you can see, you could take it to battle. Uh oh, I see some cinder over here too, I forgot about. It would still do just fine. <laughs> and she's empty. Oh, look at her smoke. I didn't get you too hot there, did I? I'm trying to take care of you. Oh boy. So an early AR-15. Uh, I've had this thing a long time now. And uh, as I've said before, the, maybe the most amazing fact I haven't even mentioned today about this firearm is, is that uh, it is kind of an evil firearm. You know, these AR-15s, you know how they are. It's never hurt anybody, you know, in all those decades of my owning it. And uh, it's just, just been a range gun. You know, it it, uh, it behaves itself. It doesn't seem to have a, uh, uh, I hear people throw around this term gun violence, and I don't know which ones are violent, but you know, even the firearms like this that I've owned through the years, they've never shown any violent tendencies at all. They, in fact, they seem kind of friendly to me. So, you know, there's just no violent guns in my collection. But anyway, the good old A2, thought you might enjoy coming out with us today, bring it out for a chapter two on the main range and shoot a little bit and take a little trip back into yesteryear when things were simpler, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, didn't have a cell phone. I remember being in that gun shop thinking, man, if I just had a cell phone, you know, I could call around, I could check the internet and, and compare pricing. I couldn't do it. I had no internet access, uh, you know, in 84. It was really frustrating. So anyway, I went ahead and bought the firearm. And uh, here it still is. And life is good. Oh, hey, how you guys doing? I'm training for my next career to be a ninja. But while you're here, I wanted to remind you to check out our friends over at SDI, the Sonoran Desert Institute. They are a fully accredited online distance learning program where you can be accredited, you can get a, get a uh, you can get certified in gunsmithing and also get an associate's degree in firearms technology. They also accept GI Bill, so veterans out there, um, check them out at sdi.edu. And also, don't forget to check out our friends over at vaultechsafe.com. You've seen their pistol safes on the shooting table in some of our videos, so check them out. And if for anything else, basically, go to hickok45.com. You can find our store there. We've got some t-shirts and hats over there. And also you can check us out on Facebook. There's a Hickok 45 Facebook. There's the real Hickok 45 at Instagram, Hickok 45 on Twitter. There's the Hickok 45 and Son YouTube channel. And uh, then I've got some social media stuff. If you search John Hickok, you can find me. And uh, we also have some videos on full30.com, if I didn't mention that yet. But just go to the website and you can find most of those things and I appreciate you guys and I'll get back to uh, figuring out how to be a ninja.